uh, social security and a redlining all the way to issues with zip code and life expectancy. Today, we're going to continue to go deeper into that conversation uh, with a number of, number of clergy members and community leaders, including, and you should see them on your screen uh, right now, the Reverend Cortez Easton, the Reverend Sarita Wilson Guffin, and Mr. Darren Thomas II. Um, and so please take a moment to get settled if you uh, have any folks that haven't had a chance, um, sorry, haven't had a chance to get on, make sure you let them know that we are now live. We're also live on our Church Health Facebook page, and you can find a recording of this after um, our time together via Facebook, as well as in the email communications that we'll be following. If you are a clergy person or a faith leader, you can also join the Clergy COVID-19 uh, Facebook group, the link of which is on your screen. Um, and you will also uh, be able to participate in this conversation by seeing our uh, Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A is the only way in which we'll be answering questions this uh, morning. Please do not use the chat. Please use a Q&A um, as well as uh, if you're on Facebook, you can type your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get to them now. But at this time, I'm going to turn over the conversation to Dr. Holtz as she continues to lead us in our discussion this morning. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be present with three extraordinary pastors who are here to share stories with us about how health disparities live in Black communities and how Black church traditions empower and equip their participants, their congregation members, to find a place where they belong, where they are strengthened, and where they can be protected against the worst effects of the social determinants of health that we talked about last time. Um, our conversation will touch on COVID-19 from time to time. It's inevitable in times like this. You can't talk about health without talking about the pandemic. But we want to call attention to the fact that the disparities we see between Black and white in COVID-19 are interesting to us not because they are exceptional. They're interesting to us because they are normal. They are precisely what we should have expected. In a way, what the pandemic does is hold a magnifying glass to these underlying realities. So we're gonna have a conversation today about three dynamics of health disparities. First, we're gonna be talking about how clinical encounters can build or undermine trust in African-American communities. Second, we're going to be thinking about the social forces that create opportunities for good health or pose obstacles to it. And then finally, we're going to talk about how Black church traditions support Black communities and activate members in ways that are health protective. I am absolutely honored to be in the presence of these three amazing pastors. I have learned so much from each of them, and I know that you will join me in being grateful for their expertise across the course of the next hour. As we discussed among ourselves what we wanted this conversation to look like, one of the participants proposed that we need to begin with authentic stories, that right at the heart of Black church traditions is the, is the sense of telling the story right, of, of inviting others into our narratives. And so what I'm going to begin with is a simple question to the three participants. What story do you bring that can help us understand how health disparities live in your communities? I'd like to jump right in and start off and just share um, what uh, myself and my wife have experienced uh, recently uh, as far as disparities in the healthcare system um, because of our skin color. So we believe. Um, I just had a newborn, Savannah Grace, God bless her soul. She is a month old just a couple of days ago. Um, this is my wife's second term pregnancy. The first term were twins. And uh, we 
uh, encountered some minor preeclampsia, um, toxemia uh, that time. So we were on high alert this time uh, with this pregnancy. We were on high alert for postpartum preeclampsia, this toxemia. Um, awareness is uh, no to inexistent um, in this uh, uh, surrounding this. Uh, situation, especially in the African American community. Um, not many people knew what toxemia even was before Serena Williams and Beyonce um, brought uh, national awareness to this uh, situation. But um, surrounding Black women in the healthcare system, they don't have a voice, they're undervalued. Um, when uh, complaints of pain are, are given, uh, medical staff. Uh, do all but dismiss those claims. And that leads to our Black women, our African-American women uh, dying at a three to four times uh, rate uh, than our white counterparts. And I just want to share that personal experience uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Holtz, and everyone participating because awareness is where we start. Nothing can happen until those in power can really understand um, the, the, the gravity of to, as to what is really going on on the ground level. My, my perspective is a little bit different. Uh, my, my personal stories have not been uh, that, but working in the healthcare system directly on the front lines as an African-American woman, uh, sometimes being the voice for other African-Americans within the healthcare system, sometimes being the voice for those who stand on the front lines, um, who still also feel very marginalized in the work that we do. Um, th that's kind of where my story begins. Um, and even if I back up a little bit before I was in this career, I, served, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So understanding what it means to be an African-American woman, um, sometimes who's been, um, who's in authority, but not empowered yet to be able to give voice to a lot of situations. Uh, so, so, so when we talk about a lot of the things that are happening in our community, specifically with um, some of the police brutality, some of the racially charged incidents that are happening across our cities, and how do we handle that in the workplace? How do we handle the microaggressions that come? How do we cope and deal with and better understand our patients when you have a patient population that reflects the population of the city, but most of the workforce does not look like us? How do you have those conversations and how do you have a safe place at work where you are um, engaging people in difficult conversations and allowing people the space in their workplace to have the difficult and hard conversations to be to make it more comfortable to make us to bring us to a place of understanding and so my story is there and being that voice and being that bridge between leadership and first uh, frontline staff that being that bridge between african american colleagues and non african american colleagues uh, and being and being that um, voice to bring it all together so that's where my story comes and it's not always easy um, you would think that uh, we were all on the same page at all times, but we're not. And that's just the reality and coping with the reality of knowing that you can't change everybody's thought process or their belief system, but you can be the bridge to kind of bring it all together for the work of in this pediatric environment, the children. So uh, I'm excited to be on this call. Uh, I'm so happy for this conversation to, to be taking place. My story is framed more on the mental health side of health. Because oftentimes when we look at health and we talk about health disparities, we often focus in and zero in our attention in on one area, which is the physical health, but we forget to talk about, or sometimes even the spiritual health but we forget to really focus in on this mental and emotional aspect. Um, for me, where my story really kicks in is when I was trying to finally get myself interested and invested in a therapist, I, as an African-American black man, was having a hard time because I wanted to find somebody that could look like me, that could understand my story, that could understand the trauma that goes on with things such as losing a black father at the age of six years old, that can understand what it's like to be black and to be bullied because of you are black. Uh, and really trying to and struggling with gaining access to a therapist 
Um, I tell you now, it wasn't really until this year that I actually gained a therapist who looks like me, who understands my story and can really help me to walk through my life and through uh, my life as a black man and as a black man who follows Christ. And so I come, in from, come at it from the standpoint of this idea of access to healthcare. What, what is access and what does that access really look like? And how do we ensure that black folk in, in the city and black folk in general gain access to healthcare? You've all named something so important, which is that we tend to identify with people who have had similar life experiences to our own. And, and Blackness is um, guaranteed in the US to produce a set of experiences that no one who isn't Black can possibly understand at a really deep level. But, but African-Americans are really underrepresented in the healthcare system as providers. And so that means that every African-American coming into a clinical setting already has this kind of disadvantage that, mm -hmm. um, that we don't have this natural sort of affiliative mm -hmm. connection with mm -hmm. our providers. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. What, um, given that reality, and we don't have a magic wand to change that in the next five years, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're working on it, right? But, but we, we can't just fix that like snap our fingers. So how do, we, how do we cope with that while we're living with the reality that the workforce does not reflect the patient population? I think I one think of the things, I'm sorry. I, th ahead, I think Rosa. one of the things is to find allies. And so mm -hmm. people like yourself who are not of African-American descent, but are allies and who really understand is one thing. And the other thing is education. It is not always on your African American colleagues to educate you, but it is but it is your responsibility as an ally and to, to use your voice. You know, as often said, it's the it's not it's the silence of our friends, you know, that that, that kills us. And so we need you to speak up. We need more people who understand what it um, who want to understand the plight of African Americans in healthcare more people who are more physicians, more providers, more practitioners who um, understand what their own microaggressions are, who understand what their own biases are and are willing to dig deep enough to deal with them so that they can provide better healthcare, better access and understand what the plight really is. The issue is often not the, the diagnosis. The issue is often the, the access to getting the care for the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's the transportation, it's the food deserts, it's the mm -hmm. lack of resources for medication, it's the health, it's the insurance and, and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. On top of all the social determinants that the family deals with every day. So when mm -hmm. in the pediatric environment, when a child comes to the hospital, it's not just the child, it's the whole family system, mm -hmm. it's the whole dynamic that's coming in with them. So learning mm -hmm. how to care for the entire child, which sometimes means a village of people because we are a people mm -hmm. that practice the village community uh, I believe in it strongly. I'm a product of it. It's, it's that's part of what has to happen. So we may not have, we're still turning out more and more African American doctors and physicians and practitioners and providers. But in the meantime, those that are here who are not African American or not minority have to do the work. And the work is not just the medical aspect of giving care. It's being able to provide for the whole uh, dynamic that that family and that patient need. That's huge, Sarita, and I salute you and your position and the insight that you're given and using your platform to do just that. And in addition to uh, uh, gaining allies in those positions to help us, awareness is everything. We're doing uh, a great deal today just bringing awareness to this. Dr. King had a quote, and I don't have it, uh, you know, memorized or anything, but it said that people uh, fail to get along because they fear each other and they fear each other because they don't communicate. And what we're doing now, communication is everything. When we begin to understand real stories from those real people, then doctors who never lived that life, nurses who may not come from that culture can give that holistic care that's necessary. And I salute you for that. 
y'all are hitting on some major stuff because literally Cortez, I can't call her Sarita because she's like, like my other mama, so I cannot say Sarita. But Reverend Sarita, what y'all are really hitting on is something that I've talked to some uh, of the allies or the white allies is, are you listening? Mm -hmm. Are you mm -hmm. really listening? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I told them and I described it in this way. Are you postured to speak or positioned to listen? Because right. there's a difference. Because if you're postured to speak, you are preparing yourself that even as I'm sharing my experience, I'm telling you about what's going on, mm -hmm. you are ready to say something even before. Mm -hmm. And that didn't give you a chance to process it. But when you're positioned to listen, you're mm -hmm. able to sit down and begin to process and begin to start to think and begin to really try to understand what it exactly is that I'm saying and begin to maybe even ask questions to help you understand the experience. Right. So it has that that listening that 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 is a huge part in that, that communication mm -hmm. piece. Yeah. Wow. It's powerful. Absolutely. So we I mean, already started moving us from this question of how, how do we manage that kind of the interpersonal dynamic, the, I'm feeling really weird being in the position of the person who's supposed to prompt these questions because I want to like, I think what Darren said was exactly right. I want to sit, I want to listen, I need to hear the stories. But Sarita, you already made this bridge between that clinical encounter and all of those social forces that are affecting it access to food, transportation, and so forth. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can we, can we pivot a little bit and think about some of those sorts of um, challenges and how they're affecting Black communities in this moment? But before we do that, Cortez, you were about to hop in there, I think. No, I'm, I'm going, let's, let's go with the flow. Let, let's, let, let, let's let the train sail. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think some of the things people don't realize, as I said, when a person comes into the hospital, the whole dynamic, the whole family system comes with them. And mm -hmm. as an African American, um, first of all, you, you know, understanding that there's a very fine line between the middle class and the poor. There's a very, very fine line. And just because you work every day does not mean you have access to resources. It does not mean that you have disposable income. It does not mean you have additional in case um, or reserve in case someone gets sick and someone needs medication and that sort of thing. So to recognize that just because you work every day does not mean that things are at your fingertips is one thing. The other thing is to realize that we live in Memphis, Tennessee. This is one of the most impoverished cities in the nation, whether we realize it or not. And you know, the, no matter where you live, poverty is a big factor uh, mm -hmm. in, in our in our in our society. It is, and poverty is the driving force for lack of resources for crime for so many other different things. And they all become social determinants that um, prevent care from going forth. And so, for instance, we see in the hospital, a, a parent that um, a nurse may say, well, she's never here. Well, she's a single mother with five other children at home with no car and the transportation system is not running right now or does not run all hours of the night or may not, have, may not run um, frequently in her neighborhood. Um, you know, we, you just never know, or she may have a job, but it's a low paying job and she can't afford to take off. Uh, it may be a job with no benefits. So you have to realize that all of those sort, or recognizing and realizing that all of those sorts of things are, are big barriers to healthcare um, when it comes to uh, how we take care of our patients and our families. And, and you know, even now when we think about um, um, the situation with the pandemic and with school and with people having access, every child does not have internet service. Everybody does not have high Wi-Fi. Everybody does not have a cell phone that, you know, and so we talk about, well, maybe we can, um, you know, um, do some type of telehealth with this family. Well, this family may not have internet at home. So how can you do telehealth? And so being able to recognize that we have to come up with ways to meet the needs of the of the people instead of the needs of the people coming to us. We have to have enough wherewithal and um, knowledge to know and understand that, you know, it's more than just the diagnosis mm -hmm. and the social and the spiritual mm -hmm. diagnosis, the mental and the emotional diagnosis mm -hmm. are the diagnosis. Yeah, that's huge. Holistic care is necessary. Absolutely. Holistic care is absolutely necessary. Um, you can't, 
when you, you can't think that, a, that that family is just coming in for that baby in the fever. You know, someone had to take off work to come to the hospital, mm -hmm. all of those issues. And mm -hmm. although minute to some people, Mm -hmm. They are major for many families. Yes. I, I come from the 38108. I'm from North Memphis. I'm from that 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 one of the poor zip codes in Memphis, Tennessee. So I still have relationship with a lot of people in that that still live that. And that's the connection. You, you talk about a bridge. That's the connection that has to happen from the people that are living these disparities to those mm -hmm. that are implementing laws and, and, and you know, uh, that affect these people, that's the bridge that needs to take place. Those mm -hmm. are the people that have to be able to sit down and talk so that they can understand because honestly, implicit bias takes place all the time. We live in an inherently racist system and some mm -hmm. people live that and not, and, and won't claim to be explicit racist. So, you know, communication has to take place for that to even be realized. You brought up a very important point because I think about how systematically rules are broken for some people and not other people, Absolutely. even in healthcare. So when you talk about um, if you have a family of influence, well, they may know be neighbors with someone who's of high office or high, holds a high position, mm -hmm. and but they can get mm -hmm. stuff done. Whereas someone who wow. has no resources, no connection, no relationship with anybody wow. in the hospital, any leadership can't get anything wow. done. And it's, it's inequitable and it's not fair. And so talking mm -hmm. about who has, you know, where does the justice lie and where is the equity lie? It's not there. It's not mm -hmm. there. Right. Yeah. And what you are, what you're hitting on too is is you know really helping people to understand the difference between equity and equality mm -hmm. um, because we we get those where we use them like they're synonyms and this they are farthest from they are not synonyms at all mm -hmm. that equity piece is really about providing resources for the group that truly needs it it's not just about making sure that we all are all on the same level playing field. Uh, I saw an illustration not too long ago that showed what equality, how equality and equity look, where it literally had a person, three people having the access to a stool, like a, a platform, and everybody had the opportunity. Well, that's equality. But ex equity is when that person that is the shortest, the most disenfranchised, mm -hmm. has the ability to gain access. Absolutely. The access piece is is, is so so key, uh, and I, a lot of people are missing the mark and the opportunity to really help push that forward and really saying we need we need access. We mm -hmm. we really need access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that access is only going to come from those in power giving some of that power up and that's going to be tough and that's mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. has to that's the conversation that has to be had at this table between the right. disenfranchised those marginalized mm -hmm. and those in power those mm -hmm. in power have to be willing mm -hmm. to give some of that power up and that's the only way this is going to work this is the only way that equity or equality both will be achieved um and, and that, that that's what we have to pray about for those who are in power to, uh, you know, want to give up some of that power. I think you're right. And I think that's where the difficult conversations come in because oftentimes people of privilege don't recognize that they have privilege, right? And mm -hmm. people that, we all have biases, even as African-Americans, we have biases. We all have mm -hmm. our belief system. We all have what we've been exposed to. We all have what we were have been raised with. And so we mm -hmm. all have biases, but understanding and recognizing when you have privilege and when you mm -hmm. have, privilege and authority and empowerment and how mm -hmm. to use that in a way that benefits and helps other people and is not just self-serving becomes the issue. So Absolutely. helping it for us that are at the table um, and have a voice, using our voice to help people recognize and, and calling out and, and yeah. us not being silent, but calling out those inequities and calling out those biases and calling out that position of privilege and helping people to use that and showing people where that can be used um, for the building up of better. For me, the that a word, the, I'm sorry, Dr. Um, that for me, what you all have named is really key. This sense that, you know, 
people people in Memphis don't know their place. I mean, but I mean, they don't know what place they're in. If, mm -hmm. Even if you think about the way our roadways are constructed, you can drive very easily from a very white part of you know East Memphis to a place of work downtown and have no idea that you're moving through a black space. Mm -hmm. And so I just recently did um, a, a three week health disparities immersion experience with some residents, um, medical residents. And, um, you know, where the medical district is, is, is very close to 38106, 38109. It's, it's mm -hmm. right across the street from mm -hmm. Nutbush, Smoky City, Klondike. And mm -hmm. these residents have been in Memphis for like four years and they had no idea where those neighborhoods were, what the, what the names of those neighborhoods were. Mm -hmm. So a large part of what we did for that education was simply send people into neighborhoods and say, you should see where your patients come from, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's not just knowing your place, it's knowing the history that made that place that way. It's not mm -hmm. accidentally that way. There's a history of policy, and I'm not going to go back and repeat that whole thing from two weeks ago, but from redlining, oh gosh, not even starting with redlining, but you know, right. you got to start the story somewhere, right? So from segregation to redlining to FHA loans to all of that kind of history, environmental racism and everything else, that made those neighborhoods what they are, that I feel like is that bigger structural story that doesn't get told. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. we forget about those big structures, we end up saying, well, why are these people just acting like this? Why are they making mm -hmm. the choices? Wow. That and then, wow. okay, sorry, I got a little preachy there. That aggravates <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, you bring up a good point because we often see um, issues that come to our ethics committee Mm -hmm. And they're not really ethics commit um, ethics issues. They're really issues of moral distress because mm -hmm. of somebody else's discomfort mm -hmm. with the way that a family has made their own decisions based on what's best for them. And so all of those structural things, all of this, these systematic forces that are in place have uh, driven people to make decisions that are best for them. That if you don't look like me and you don't live like me, you have no idea why this is why I have to make the decisions I have to make. So... Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't understand that I had an aunt who was on life support at one time and I have an issue of trust because the doctor said one thing and what her body did and what her physical health did was a completely different thing. So, yes, I want to keep my child on, on, on sustaining support until I'm ready to take it off or my faith informs how I do this, then mm -hmm. don't judge my faith. Because as African Americans, we tend to be very connected to our faith. Our faith and our health are very closely tied. There is no disconnect. So when you start talking about all those structural things in place, you talk about also the black church being the structure that holds our health and our faith and not being able to dismantle that. So when you bring all these issues of morality or eth of ethics rather and moral distress, you have to understand who you're dealing with. <laughs> Just because the person bleeds like you does not mean the person lives like you, thinks like mm -hmm. you, worships like you. And that's a big component to the um, barriers that we face in the healthcare system. Yeah, yeah. Policymakers, lawmakers, uh, those who have control don't look like what, don't look like those people who those laws and policies govern. Right. There's always going to be a disconnect there. And, and also, uh, has I'll go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, Doc. I, I was just saying that there also needs to be uh, a level of an A word that people really don't like to use, accountability. Accountability. So we're talking about, yeah. we're talking about uh, putting people, and, and, and we do this not only when it comes to uh, those that have power that don't look like us, but we're also talking about it from those in power that look like us. Mm -hmm. So now that they are at the table, are we holding them accountable for yeah. what they said that they were going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's one thing to just tell people who are at the table who don't look mm -hmm. like us, you know, but also helping the folks to understand that are that may look like us. I'm also holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. My wife mm -hmm. is the city councilwoman for District 7. She's my wife, but I still hold her accountable for the fact that she is overseeing City Council District 7. That, District that, account of, that accountability is very, 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 yes. very key. 
um, right. for us to really push people and remind them, uh, don't forget, I voted for you. I put, I helped you get there. Not, not the other. You didn't help me. No, I helped you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. because I, mm -hmm. I helped you, don't forget me because I helped you. Um, and sometimes that accountability not only comes from an individual, but it also requires a group effort. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a group. There needs to be people, people, not just a person, but people holding people of power accountable. Mm -hmm. um, the united minds, like-minded folks uh, that are really pushing to hold that accountability forward. All of that is, man, so true. And the church usually plays a huge part in that. But the uh, pandemic strain has pushed the church away from purpose almost. We, we almost cannot be as impactful as we have once been prior to the pandemic with even our memberships, with even the past, the level of pastoral care that I'm able to give without seeing my people on a regular basis. I mean, it's very trying times for the church and finding that group for support um, as my brother is, is speaking of. The pandemic has been hard on the church. I think as African-Americans, we rely on the church. It's always been the epicenter of our community. So I definitely agree that it's been difficult, but I think we're in a season now where pastoral, pastoral care takes precedent and we're preaching Absolutely. almost takes the back seat. We have to learn yeah. how to care for our people in very untraditional ways. And when we can't mm -hmm. touch them, um, when we can't see them, we've got to find ways to still be able to connect with them. Right. And, and so thank God for platforms, right, of social social media and, mm -hmm. and Zoom and all those things. But for people who don't have that access, you mm -hmm. know, it's the basic simple phone call. It's call. the basic simple put a card in the mail so people mm -hmm. know that they stay connected and people are thinking of them. I think mm -hmm. the other thing with the church in terms of health care and addressing some of the disparities, especially as it relates to the pandemic, is what are we doing in the community? If you are a pastor, if you are a church and your church is not doing anything in the community, what are you doing? What are you preaching mm -hmm. about? Right. What is your purpose? And you might have to mm -hmm. redefine what your purpose is as a church and as a mm -hmm. pastor and as a preacher in this season, because your mm -hmm. real purpose is now beyond the walls. It should have never really been within the walls to begin with. Mm -hmm. So connecting, what resources do we have for testing in our community mm -hmm. at our churches? What resources mm -hmm. are we providing to help people get food? to help mm -hmm. people get school supplies, to help people with basic mm -hmm. uh, essentials of clothing. What resources mm -hmm. do we have, um, even as MLG and W is suspending cutoffs, that's coming mm -hmm. back and they're still charging. What yes. resources are we are we providing to help people pay util the utility bills? You know, mm -hmm. what are we as the church providing to help people stay healthy? <clears throat> Absolutely. I, I so, I'm, I'm so on board with that, Dr. Sarita mm -hmm. and I'm, 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 I, I echo everything that you're saying. I've, I've been a pastor for about one year where I am, and mm -hmm. I've been trying to push my people to being a church beyond the walls because a church that only cares for what's inside of those walls is not a church at all. I so, I so concur with you. Yeah. And that's, that's another message that we have to share with our, our clergy sisters and brothers because a theology that's not beyond those walls is not not it's not liberation at all, and that's right. not what we should be doing. Yeah, thank you for that. Agree. And I tell people too that one of the things that really needs to happen is is that uh, I compare it to tools. Pastors, clergy, and this is for pastors. This is for regular lay, lay people. This is for the, anybody. We have to provide the resources, but we also mm -hmm. have to help people to understand or know uh, how to use those resources. So we cannot provide the tool without showing people how to use it. It's just like I'm going into a house and you give me a screwdriver and you tell me that I need to fix something. Okay, well, I've, I've never used a screwdriver before. I, well, how do I know what I'm supposed to do with it? And what that also means is that the clergy person or the lead person, the shepherd, should be the example for the congregation of what this really looks like. 
So mm -hmm. if I'm asking my congregation and I'm admonishing them or pleading with them to go mm -hmm. and spend time at the doctor or go to see a therapist, am I as the pastor or the clergy person, the lead person saying, I too actually do go see my therapist okay. every now and then. Um, mm -hmm. Am I the one that's talking to them and saying, yes, I actually did get up before I, mm -hmm. before I did my live stream broadcast and worked out this morning. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I, I did do that. Mm -hmm. um, are, are we as clergy as we are, we as shepherds and in and, mm -hmm. and whatever form that is, not that you don't have to be the lead pastor, right. but we're just Absolutely. talking about if you are pastoring people, um, mm -hmm. what are you doing that shows that you are an example of that which you're with of that which you're trying to get the people to do? We all know the perfect example of a great shepherd was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted the disciples to learn how to pray. He didn't just tell them pray, but he also showed them what this praying is That's about it. and how to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted the disciples to rest. He showed them how to actually stop, pause, and rest. So are mm -hmm. we also providing ourselves as examples of what this really looks like? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, the conversation moving to the church just makes me think that um, this is a conversation that we are not having, certainly not having enough in the white church, because, you know, white churches hold so many resources, and that's Ooh. not by some virtue of the people who are members or of their ancestors. The resources white churches hold are by virtue of, you know, a racist history. Mm. And so I think we also need some really hard conversations about how white churches move from a kind of paternalistic charity model toward um, something that looks like reparations. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, you're talking about the church has got to provide these resources. Yeah, but asking black churches to provide mm -hmm. those resources can sometimes be a blood from a turnip proposition. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to figure out how in this city we host some really hard conversations between black and white churches about why white churches have the resources that they do. And, um, and how do you make those resources available in a way that isn't, um, well, okay, so I'm thinking about reparations, right? When you owe someone something, because you've stolen it. You don't get to tell them what to do with it. You right. Don't to, like, right, I sue somebody and I get a payout for that. This is not a thing I've done, right? But they don't get to tell me how to spend that money. Right. right. So we need some conversation about what does that flow of <clears throat> resources look like when the people making the decisions about how the resources should be used are not the people who hold the resources. So mm -hmm. I think what I'm doing right now is asking church health to sponsor some kind of follow-up. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we have this real conversation between white and black churches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's important. On that. <laughs> it's important because especially small churches like mine, uh, we don't have those resources to give back to the community. Um, we, we, we barely have resources to to maintain ourselves. Thank God our building is paid for and we don't have a mortgage during this pandemic. But uh, my, I, I, a lot of churches do have that dynamic and they're struggling, almost about to lose their building. And some are going through that now. Um, so that's a very important discussion, but how we do that, those with power, those white churches with that money, that power have to be willing to let it go. And, and that's, that's where we meet at the table. Uh, they have to be willing to let it go. And like you said, um, don't tell the pastor what to do with the money or even tell the pastor, preacher, layman what to preach because that happens too if they're receiving money. They can't preach on certain issues. They can't protest. They can't stand up for social justice when they're receiving money from certain entities. So that's another discussion. And Kendra, you got your hands full. <laughs> I really thank you for this opportunity. I was thinking about that. I think it's a dual process too, right? So, and also Cortez, there are large churches that also, large black churches that also don't have the resources. Um, yeah, you know, it's yeah, a big yeah. building. It might be mm -hmm. a lot of people, but yeah. you know, it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that we have uh, 
the, the same access as some of the white churches, but I think it's a dual right. process. One is, yeah, we have to have these conversations with the, about these resources and how we choose to allocate them. And, and that's an education process. The second part to that too is liberation theology. I mean, what are you preaching? What are you, what are you right. understanding? And as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brother, you've done it unto me. Love your neighbor. Those basic tenets and principles that we live on have mm. to become very real and very lived. Absolutely. And that's what's not happening. We're still living two different Bibles, right? My we we got to come out the same place. Oh my God. Right. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting because I was talking to a, a white uh a white colleague of mine and he was trying to un really understand what he could do uh in order to help with the, the black church and in particular with black health care uh disparities and um and mind you he's a follower of christ and he's like i'm just trying to really find it right in the bible you know he said i see some examples in the new testament i said well um i said what does proverbs 31 say he said, oh, that's the one about the virtuous woman, right? I was like, yeah, that's the one that people typically talk about. I said, but if you go back before you get to Proverbs 31, 10, where it starts with the virtuous woman, I said, you backtrack just two more verses and you go right. to 8 and 9, where it says, speak up for those who are unable to speak for themselves. Make sure that they receive justice. I said, oh, mm -hmm. that's you can start there because I said, you know, mm -hmm. I know like a lot of people like to disconnect the Bible and try to make it seem like it's just, you know, in New Testament stuff is when, mm -hmm. when reconciliation and uh, liberation really started. But I was like, but if you go back to Proverbs, you go further back, you know, you just keep going back is when the liberation really started. And so helping him to really understand that and see that that, that this is uh, biblical, uh, this liberation is biblical. In as much so as that it requires all of us to really do the work, and and it and it's really especially important too for uh, the black church uh, to continue to build coalition to go and approach uh, mm -hmm. the white church. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it it is it, it's good too because now it's an opportunity for you as I, I was reading a book. It's called The Social Teaching of Black Churches. It's by mm -hmm. Peter Paris. And in that book, in, one, in the appendix of it, it talked about saying that, uh, it said that the Negroes should not be apologetic or should not apologize for the existence of groups or coalitions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There should be no apology about building these black church coalitions or clergy groups especially mm -hmm. if it's going to help in liberation and really go and and, uh, and approach white privilege and really push to ensure that we knock on that door and mm -hmm. say, look, we're coming to get what's out. We're coming back and, and we need to talk to you and we'll keep coming back to your church every week if we need to in order to ensure that you hear us because we are here to ensure that we can do all that we can for our community, but we need we need to get what we need some we need what you what you trying to hold on to some of them resources that you you trying to hold on to. We get ready to come grab some of that. We get ready get ready to take some of it, and then we are gonna you know how you, folks flip stuff. We are gonna flip it and reinvest it back into the community, and we'll we'll you know we'll tell you thank you. We, you know, we'll we'll say thank you. I, I guess we'll tell you thank you because that's the Christian thing to do. But 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 we we're coming. We're, and and that's one of the key things. We're we're coming. We're, we're not we're not backing down. We we are coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said we. There's power in unity, and there's power in those affinity groups, and there's power mm -hmm. in coming together um, and there being no divisions among us as, as a community and as a black people and as a liberated people. Um, we've got to approach this thing um, and the barriers to healthcare and access together. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got to be unified and what that's another sermon for another day. We've got to be unified Amen. and so come together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So there's a question somebody has posed in the Q&A and I'm wondering if you all might like to or take a crack at this. Um, this person is asking, what, what about, how do we address internalized racism and health disparities? That is a good question. That's a loaded question. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think when you talk about things that have been internalized, this, you know, we've been so conditioned to um, accept um, the healthcare system as it is. We've been so conditioned because of the history of betrayal and mistrust and distrust that um, a lot of the things have become intrinsic, right? right? And we pass it on from generation to generation. We pass it on um, and it becomes this cycle that is so, so very hard to break. So I was talking to someone very, very recently in my age group in late mid to late fifties who still does, has a, a walking around limping, having a major distrust of doctors and in pain who still keeps money at the house in a jar and not in a bank. And so this internalized racism, these, these, these things that we've kind of learned to live with ourselves and have been conditioned um, that we just because, because we're black, but we are um, susceptible and prone to continue to live this way is something that um, we have to learn to do differently. One is that self-love has to become very key. Um, you gotta love yourself in order to take care of yourself, in order to provide for yourself, in order to practice good self-care and health care. So one of the first things is self-love. You gotta love being black. You gotta know that every day you wake up and every night when you go to sleep, you are an African-American woman or male and you gotta be proud about it and love that fact. You don't have to allow that to be um, um, something that, you don't have to allow your blackness to become a barrier. That's something to be proud of and stand up in and stand strong in. So the first thing I think in talk, talking about internalized racism is self-love. And with mm -hmm. self-love comes self-care. And with self-care mm -hmm. comes health care. And with mm -hmm. health care comes taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where the internalized thing starts. And that's part of not only loving yourself, but surrounding yourself with people who love you, who look like you, who love you, who know how mm -hmm. to treat you, who treat you right in relationships whether it's a, 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 a platonic relationship or a marital relationship or a dating relationship or a mother to child relationship or a sister, whatever it is, being mm -hmm. around people who love you and who know how to love you so that you can continue to learn how to love yourself and that you create this social system and this um, village of love and of mm -hmm. people who love, who look like you and knowing that black love is, is, is power. Mm -hmm. And it starts there. That's my crack <clears throat> at it, which I got. <laughs> Hey, I just want to chime in on your black love is power and go back to movement and go back to movements like black power. And that's what movements like that was all about. It was about self-love, love as a people, love as a community, mm -hmm. realizing the disparities in which we live. We have to remain strong. We have to remain, you know, uh, 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 well grounded, you know, and united and united uh we have to remain together and, and and like you said that's another sermon because we know how difficult that can be even in our own community being on one accord so we pray for that and uh i'm thankful for you dr sarita thankful for you dr holtz and thankful for you my brother and sharing with me because i did glean from you today i know we're closing in i won't say anything else but thank you and thank you and thank you I just want to add one thing and loving the God in you and knowing that mm -hmm. God looks like you. It's not some ide ideolo idealistic picture of some white God with long blonde hair and blue eyes. It's a God My that God. looks like me and you and yes, loving that God within you and knowing that that God loves you back. That's where you start to deal with internalized racism um, because you're not worshiping and serving and having faith in some God who's some far off distant white man. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No, God mm -hmm. looks like you. Yeah. Jesus looks like us. Yeah. And we as and we as black people have to continue to do something that uh, Paul talked about, which was planting and watering. Um, mm -hmm. Says Paul and Paulo said, "One plants, one waters, but it's up to the Lord to get the increase." Thank Man, you, I'm telling y'all, I it's been so many times where I have literally responded to emails mm -hmm. and said, "Good morning, Black Queen." Good morning, Black King. Just to plant this seed that I'm just reminding you, brother or sister, that at the end mm -hmm. of the day, I see, I don't see you, I see you as a black king or a black queen. And us really being intentional about planting those seeds among our black community. Mm -hmm. and, and and not only just uh with 
uh, those who are younger, because we're supposed when the young younger generation, but also in our older generation, our season as we call them the season saints. So we don't have to call them old. They're just seasoned. They they've been here. Uh, God marinated on them a longer time now that they are a little older. Um, <laughs> really reminding them too that they still are yet black kings and black queens no matter what their age is they are still yet holding on to this royalty status that they've been gifted by god and so us continuing to walk around to each other and, and that's my hope too that we will do in within the black community in our black churches as well is tell our congregants I, you know, I know we serve the great king uh, called Jesus. We serve and we call him King Jesus. But also, you you were made royal. And in and, and, and having that royalty factor, you're a blessing to be here. And to be black is, my goodness, is really to be beautiful. For real, for real. I am so outrageously grateful for this conversation. I, I cannot say how much I have learned in the past hour. And I am so grateful that this is recorded and I'm gonna go back and I was madly taking notes as you were talking, but of course you can never get everything down. Um, this is such, a, um, such an honor and such a privilege to be able to listen in as you share your wisdom with each other and with our audience. We have a terrific follow-up question about what white pastors should be advocating for. And that's a different conversation, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's a conversation we need. That's a hard one. But I'm so grateful that Church Health took this time to center Black pastors and Black voices. And um, I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm blathering now, except I, I, I'm having trouble saying how grateful I am enough. So to all of you, my deepest, deepest gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. for, for Thank you. this platform and inviting us. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Each of you have the thanks of Church Health um, and the entire Church Health family that is here for taking the time to, as you said, Dr. Tos, invite us into this conversation. Um, as was alluded to, I think that we are having some momentum toward expanding this conversation a bit or at least continuing it. Um, and so immediate next steps for all of our attendees. Uh, uh, as was said, this uh, webinar was recorded. It's actually also live on our Facebook. And so you can immediately rewatch it there. There'll be a link uh, being sent to you uh, with this recording, as well as if you missed Dr. Hope's first uh, presentation two weeks ago, that is also live on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, and I encourage you to go ahead and watch that. You'll get next steps about where this conversation or how it will continue. Um, and with regards to a few questions that are and just as uh, we begin to end our time, um, we'll work on trying to find a way to answer that for you, whether it be via email um, or as part of the webinar series. But we are just grateful that not only you as participants took time to share with us before each and every one of our panelists who took time out of their days uh, to share their heart and share their convictions um, to, I guess, try to put a cherry on top or summarize. Um, I, I, I doubt it was intentional, but as preachers, you guys shared four A's uh, around being aware, having access to health care, uh, advocating for patients, and wrapping it up with being accountable to one another and holding those with power accountable. Four A's that I think we can all walk away with if you uh, aren't able to pick up on the incredible gems that were dropped. Uh, bring awareness, fight for access, always and hold one another in the powers that be accountable. Um, and with that, I think we'll close with a quick word of prayer. Um, and Reverend Guffin, you opened us in prayer, and I'm going to ask that you uh, close us in prayer, and we will conclude our time together. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we do come together just with thanksgiving and great gratefulness in our hearts for all that you allowed us to share for the wisdom and the knowledge that has gone forth. Now, God, we take this charge to go out um, to our communities, to our faith communities, to our workplaces, to our neighborhoods, to our families, and share this knowledge, share this wisdom, share that we might grow, that we might continue to make each other aware and bring awareness to ourselves 
that we might continue to advocate for the least of these and for those who have been marginalized by this healthcare system, that we might do whatever is in our power to share resources to help people get access and to use our influence to help others who don't have access to come into what they need and then God to be accountable and held up by what you've given us. Now, God, we pray that you bless all that has been said, that it does not fall on deaf ears, oh God, but that we might use our hands and our hearts to go out and do the work. It's in your name that we give thanks and pray. Amen. 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 Bless everyone. Amen. Have a great rest of the day. Bless you. You too. Blessings, everybody. Okay. Amen. Peace out, everybody.